Well, hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, sorry it's been a while. Um, my aim now was to give um, some reflections and uh, bounce some ideas um, of concerning the millennium. And I want to do it by discussing the th different points about the millennium. So we'll begin today with pre-millennialism. Now I'm not using this as a way to promote any one of the positions really. Um, this is just me purely reflecting on them given some ideas, maybe some strengths, some weaknesses, and you can take this away with you and see which one you believe in. And of course, there are many more than just the, the main three. Pre-millennialism is the idea that Christ would come back first to the earth, then he will reign on earth for a thousand years. He will live with his saints during that time. So um, pre-millennialism, he's going to come before the millennium. A lot of people think that um, this idea sort of came about through the um, dispensational period from Schofield and Derby, uh, but actually it goes back a lot earlier than that. In fact, some of the early uh, church fathers like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Polycarp, Papias, uh, did believe in a sort of literal reign of Christ. That is why it's sometimes called historic pre-millennialism. Um, historic meaning that um, the history of the early church fathers believed this. Um, but they connected it really with this sort of messianic age, the idea that um, Christ was the fulfillment of all those prophecies in Isaiah, Zechariah, for example, the gathering together of the people. Uh, so indeed, there was sort of a literal understanding that Christ would come back and that he would reign on earth for a certain amount of time and bring about his or oh, peace, his righteousness, the restoration of the earth, uh, probably the um, closing up of things. So there is that. Now, um, with premillennialism also comes another theory which is called um, Millennial Day Theory. Now this is the idea that um, if you are a young earth creationist and you believe the earth is um, only 6,000 years old, the 7,000 time period would be the thousand years. So in other words, just as God created the world in six days, he rested on the seventh day. Uh, if you correspond, correspond that to the thousand years, it means that we've been living here for 6,000 years. And then the final uh, Sabbath uh, thousand years, the seventh, would be a time of um, rest because Christ is coming down to bring about um, his kingdom in full this time. So um, there is that element to it as well. Um, I suppose the obvious question to ask now would be, um, is that passage in Revelation 20 meant to be taken literally? Are we talking about a uh, a literal period of a thousand years. Now, this is where we can move. We move into um, premillennial dispensationalism. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but you can see when dispensationalism came about in the 17th century uh, through Derby and uh, Schofield, which is where we come to today with a lot of the left behind. Um, and end time scenarios. See, dispensationalism is the idea that the world was um, sectioned in different dispensations. So, for example, uh, even within the six thousand years, the Old Testament period was the law was the period of the law. Jesus um, was the Gospels, and now we're living uh, in the Church Age or by living by grace. And then, of course, the dispensationalists believe that the rapture will then trigger the next dispensation, which is the tribulation. And then that will trigger the next dispensation, which would be the thousand years. So uh, it kind of corresponds. And um, in many ways, you could sort of see how it would make sense. You could maybe fit it into a nice um, little package like that. So that's why we call it pre-millennial dispensationalism. Um, now, so we need to ask ourselves this question, um, is it meant to be viewed in a literal thousand years? Because we know that in other parts of Revelation, numbers are symbolic. Um, the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7 and 14, uh, some don't see that as a, um, a literal 
uh, amount of ministers and preachers in the tribulation period who were witness to the Jews. Some see it as a an expansion of the number seven, the perfect number of seven. There are other periods where like 42 months, three and a half years, time, times, and half a time is mentioned. They're not referring to a specific time period. They, they seem to be used for more of a uh, spiritual theological use. So you could maybe see the thousand years as symbolic because even in the book of um, 2 Peter it says the day to God is like a thousand years. However, when you read Revelation 20, John really does go out of his way to tell you over and over again that it is a thousand years because he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, and bound him for a thousand years. Um, he threw him into the abyss um, and he said that, that would keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years ended and he must be th free for a short time. And then it goes on that um, those who followed Christ, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Uh, and then finally, then the second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, um, that is at least five or six times. And so it's almost like John is really stressing that it is a thousand years. I am talking about mathematically and chronologically this amount of time. The other thing to consider would be this would also be taken literally and assuming that the second coming of Christ is also mentioned in the book of Revelation. Um, Christ would come down first, then the millennium will begin. In other words, Christ is going to come to live on earth to make things right, make things better. We don't know what that's, what he's going to do in full. I mean, some uh, Bible verses give us some examples. Now, are there other passages in the Bible where we could um, correspond this way of thinking to other passages? Well, the one in Matthew 24 in the Oliver Discourse where Jesus says, one will be taken and one will be left. Um, two women will be in the field, one will be taken, the other will be left. Many dispensationalists see that as the rapture, but you find out later in the passage, he says, it will be like in the days of Noah, one will be taken, the other will be left. And of course, in the days of Noah, it was the wicked who were taken away in judgment by the flood. So you could see that as uh, when Christ comes, uh, you know, the wicked will be taken away from the earth and he will live with his people, the Christians. So you could correspond the millennium with that passage. Uh, another passage would be in 1 Thessalonians 5, where we have, um, we will meet the Lord up in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, I think, actually, uh, we'll meet the Lord up in the air and be caught up with him in the clouds. Again, some people see that as the rapture, but actually, the context of that is the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, and Paul uses the imagery that um, the greeting committee goes out to welcome the king and then they bring the king back into the city. It's not like they're departing from the city, which would be like the rapture. They go out to meet the king to come back um, because it says also the dead will rise to live with Christ. We'll meet him in the clouds. But notice it doesn't say we go to heaven. It says we meet him in the clouds. And then because of that imperial language, we come back down to live on earth with Christ. So, those passages, Matthew 24 and the one in 1 Thessalonians, um, is talking about us inviting Christ in. Now, that would open the, up the way very nicely to have the, the millennium be a literal time period of a thousand years because Christ is going to come back and he, he's going to put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy is death, as it says in 1 Corinthians. And so... Um, you could see how this uh, could make sense. Now, is the second coming mentioned in the book of Revelation? Well, we know in chapter 1, verse 7, that he says, look, he is coming with the clouds. Uh, that's a reference to the coming of the Lord. Uh, some see the opening of the sixth seal in chapter 6. The terrible day has come. God and the Lamb will show their anger and who can face it. Uh, some see that as the day of the Lord. Um, so, th so there are moments where the coming of the Lord is mentioned, but is it mentioned in sequence uh, within this section in chapter 20? Because we've just had the fall of Babylon, um, the great thrones. So uh, we'd have to 
ask ourselves, is this what it's referring to? Because look what it says, actually. First of all, it's not Christ who um, sees the dragon. It's actually the angel who John saw who came down to lock him in for a thousand years. And then notice this in chapter 20, uh, verse 4. It's talking about it's talking about those who were beheaded because of their faith, the saints, the martyrs. Um, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. See, it doesn't actually mention that Christ came down to reign for a thousand years. It's actually the martyrs. It's their reign is a thousand years without giving any indication of how long Christ's reign is. So um, it's these little details I think you need to uh, pay attention to. And so, you know, the things we assume this passage is talking about may not be the case when you break it down. Now, something else that people point out with pre-millennialism is um, the idea that even with Christ living here on earth, um, people would still want to reject him. People would still want to turn away from him. Now, that's something that people um, tend to stress in this passage because in Revelation, we have not transitioned yet to the new heaven and the new earth in 21 and 22. So um, there is a maybe something to be said uh, about that way of viewing this passage. Well, thank you everyone for letting me share my thoughts. Like I said, I'm not going to share absolutely, absolutely everything that I could dig into about this. I'm also purposefully not going to go into some points because it would be more appropriate to bring them up with the other titles, like post-millennialism, for example. So um, just take these things away with you, just uh, ponder over them and um, see what you think of this and let me know your thoughts. Uh, we'll continue next with uh, post-millennialism.